going to welcome um, Ranger Chris McDowell, who's going to lead us virtually through Mammoth Cave this morning. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you for having me with you today, and uh, I look forward to this. And, and just to kind of reiterate, uh, you can put questions in chat. I will also leave some time toward the end if you have any questions that you can just ask those questions. Um, and what I typically do is I will go through part of my program and then maybe I'll take a pause. We'll look at some of the questions, uh, answer those, and then um, jump back into the presentation. That way, if you have something that applies to a specific slide that I'm showing you, or um, if that is leading to something else, then we don't save that to the end and maybe you forget your train of thought. So um, definitely ask questions if you have questions. And since we have a small group right now, um, are you Cooper? Give me a thumbs up. You're Cooper. All right. Have you been to Mammoth Cave before? Looking for confirmation. Um, no. Okay. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Mammoth Cave is an amazing place. If you get a chance, I would encourage you to visit it, but um, it is a national park, right? So we have over 400 different national park units and they're all amazing. So if you don't get to Mammoth Cave, get out to see some national park. Uh, it will definitely be worth your time. And so what I'm going to do is I've got a PowerPoint that I'm going to put uh, pull up and I've got slides from different parts of uh, one of our most famous sections of cave. And we'll talk about uh, the cave, just like we were taking the cave tour itself, just like we were walking through the cave. And some of the stuff I say today may sound a little crazy, okay? But Mammoth Cave is a, a very unique place and uh, we're always making new discoveries about Mammoth Cave. And so our information is always getting updated. All right, so Cooper, give me a thumbs up if you can see that National Park Service emblem. Awesome, perfect. All right, so we are okay. Thank you very much there at the bottom two. Um, so we are one of, like I said, over 400 and some national park units. Uh, so there's a difference between being a national park and being a national park unit. Okay. There's a little over 60 national parks. Um, and those are places like Yellowstone or, um, Everglades or Great Smoky Mountains or Mammoth Cave. And so um, they're a little bit different than places like Abraham Lincoln's birthplace, okay? That's a historic site. Uh, there's also historic battlefields, all of these different uh, designations within the National Park Service. Now, Mammoth Cave is kind of nice because we actually have three designations. Uh, on our entry signs, when you come into the park, you notice it says Mammoth Cave National Park, then it says a World Heritage Site. And so a World Heritage Site is different than a national park. A World Heritage Site says, hey, there's so much cultural history here that's so important to everyone in the world that you get this extra designation. And then below that, it says an International Biosphere Reserve. And so that's even another different uh, designation. That means, hey, there's so much biological diversity here. Uh, what you've got going on biologically in your park is so special you get this extra designation. So we are one of the few national parks that have all three of those designations. Um, and while national parks, um, at least the, the National Park Service, the way we do it is specific to the US, um, the World Heritage Site, the International Biosphere Reserve are designations that you might see around the world. So when you come to Mammoth Cave, most people want to see the cave, right? It's what you come here for. Um, so this is the entrance where as far as we're concerned, it all began. Now this isn't where the cave started to form, but this is where people started to interact with the cave. And so this connects directly to the National Park, the International Biosphere Reserve, and the World Heritage Site, because inside this cave is a whole host of amazing things uh, that really kind of set us apart from some of the other caves. Now what's amazing about this, what I love about this, is that, um, whether you're here midsummer or midwinter, all right, we will take you into this entrance. And it makes no difference to us because once you go down these stairs, it's always the same inside. And so that's one of the great things about having a cave. Caves tend to hang around the average temperature of the area they're found in. So at Mammoth Cave, about 54 degrees Fahrenheit is where our temperature hangs out summer and winter. Now in the winter, you do get a cool breeze blowing into this entrance. It's not nearly as comfortable to stand right here uh, as it would be in the summer when the breeze is blowing out at you. But one of the things you might notice 
when you're looking at this is that there is uh, a gate back here with these bars, okay? And these bars make what we call a back gate. And so you'll notice that there's spacing in between. Humans can't fit through it, but bats can. And so this is designed to let the air flow, to let the wildlife in and out, but to keep people out of the cave. Now, you may ask yourself, why in the world do we want to keep people out of the cave if we're a national park, right? It belongs to the people. Well, we're also the longest cave system in the world at over 400 miles. So the last thing we want to do is let people just go in here because there's a good chance that they could find their way in, but they may not find their way out. Now, once we get through that gate, we are in a really cool passageway called Houchins Narrows. And the legend is that in around 1798, a young boy named John Houchins, um, living out on the land in Kentucky, was hunting, um, and he shot and wounded a black bear. The bear ran down the hill. He chased the bear down the hill. The bear went into the cave, and then guess what he did? They say he chased the bear into the cave. But let's be honest. Is anyone going to chase a wounded bear into a cave? No. So there's a good chance that story is completely made up. Uh, but because of that story, this section is named after him. Now, with that being said, John was not the first person to find this cave. Native Americans were using this cave thousands of years ago. As a matter of fact, almost 5,000 years ago. So we're talking pre-tribal Native Americans. We're talking late archaic, early woodland Indians. All right. So a lot of times we hear the names of, of tribes. Um, and so people might hear about Sioux or Cherokee or Shawnee. All right. And so that's what we kind of associate when we think um, of Native Americans and early American history. OK. But the reality is that Native Americans have been living here for a very, very long time, utilizing the natural resources. And Mammoth Cave was just another one of those. So they also walked right down this path. Now, for us, it's a little bit easy because we have all these paving stones, we have handrails, we have lights. When they came through, and even when the early settlers discovered this cave, there was a lot of loose rock on the floor. There was no lights at all. You had to use some type of fire to light your way. Uh, and that made it a much more challenging uh, experience. Now, today we want to make it accessible for everyone. So we do um, have lights and handrails. So I was asked, how long did it take to build the paving sidewalk and to put in the lights? Well, um, the easiest answer to that is that it has taken um, us currently about 205 years and we're still working on it. Um, so the paving stones that you're seeing here were put down in the 90s. Um, the rest of the historic route was done in 2016 and it took about two years to get that section done with just the flooring. We're currently working on a four mile stretch called the Grand Avenue. Uh, the lights started going in as early as the 20s in some parts of the cave. And there are parts of the cave that still don't have lights that we still take tours of, but we take it by lantern. So uh, it's always a work in progress for us here. All right, so it's also we're here with Summer School in Jessamine County. We have 15 friends watching, that is outstanding. And uh, any, anybody that has any questions, just plug them in there. Um, are tours able to happen during construction on the sidewalks? Excellent question. They are not. Um, it's unsafe when they have the construction going on in the cave for us to be roaming around. And so what we try to do is if we get money, because you have to keep in mind, we're with the government, right? And so they have these, these bunches of money that they'll pass out to different parks to do work. And so if we get that money, it takes several years to plan. And then we just shut down a section of the cave and we work on it and we give tours in other parts. And when you have 412 miles of cave, right, with about 12 miles of toured section, you can shut down two miles here and still give lots of cave tours, right? And then you can open that back up and shut down a different section and still give lots of cave tours. So we always have the option to do lots and lots of cave tours, uh, even if it's under construction. And somebody said, how far does the cave go back? And uh, like I said, we, you know, we take about 12 miles of tour routes, but we have 412 miles of cave. And right now, a group called the Cave Research Foundation is actually mapping more caves. So we haven't found the end yet. Uh, as a matter of fact, we suspect that um, we probably won't find the end of Mammoth Cave in any of our lifetimes. Right. So they've been mapping it for hundreds of years and odds are they'll continue mapping it uh, for hundreds more. 
All right, so let's move on here. When you get to the end of this area called Houchins Narrows, you walk into one of our big famous rooms called the Rotunda. So this room is about a half acre in size. Now you may not be able to visualize what a half acre looks like, but I can tell you that my house, my entire yard is a third of an acre. So that is less than the size of this room. If you were in a city, you could easily put five, six houses on this uh, with no problem. And the ceilings are 40 feet high. So you literally could build a house in here. And it's 140 feet below ground. And one of the things you might notice is that it doesn't look like most caves. It's got a big round ceiling and that round ceiling is natural and it's dry. There's not dripping water, there's not cave formations. And that's one of the things about Mammoth Cave that makes us different is we are a dry cave system. Now it doesn't mean we don't have water coming in. It doesn't mean that we don't have cave formations. That's just not what we're known for. Now, one of the things we are known for though is that history. So if you look right in the middle of this room, you can tell there's something going on in the floor. And what's going on is that uh, right after John Houchins found this cave or whoever found it in the 1790s, right, they started realizing there was a bunch of loose dry dirt on the floor. And dry dirt may not seem like it's that important, but when it's trapped inside a cave and there's no rain hitting it, then it becomes a very valuable resource because in this dirt are nitrates. And those nitrates can be taken out of the dirt and then used to make something called saltpeter. Saltpeter can be added to sulfur and charcoal. And does anybody know what that makes? It makes black gunpowder. So they were actually able to make gunpowder out of mammoth cave dirt back in the early 1800s. Now, in the early 1800s, Kentucky was the wild west. We were the frontier. Okay, so you needed gunpowder to survive. But by about 1810, we knew that we were going to need lots of gunpowder because we were about to go to war with England for a second time. This time, the war would begin in 1812. Does anybody know what war began in 1812? Somebody knew. I saw it, saw it being mouthed there. Oh, I see the chat lighting up. Let's see. Yes. Yes, the War of 1812. One of the easiest to remember. It's in the name, right? So the War of 1812 was our first real war as a new country, and we had to be able to show the world we were tough. So they developed this system inside Mammoth Cave and other caves for extracting nitrates. Now, this may look kind of weird. It's a wooden box with some dirt. You can see part of the box is missing. There's a trough here. But if you think about this like a coffee maker, it's really easy to understand, right? When you make coffee, you have a machine, right? With a basket, you put a filter in, you put coffee in, then you run water over the top and you wait. Well, this box is designed, so it's a basket with a filter and you put in the dirt and all you have to add is water and then you wait. And as that water goes through the soil, it dissolves the nitrates and they come out with the water. Then you take that back outside and you boil it. And as you're boiling it, you add potassium to it, and then you can make gunpowder. So remember that. You need dry cave dirt, a big wooden box, lots of water, and some potassium. You can make gunpowder. Well, you can make saltpeter anyway. So this cave produced about 300,000 pounds of saltpeter for the War of 1812. And it was shipped off to Delaware to a man named E.I. DuPont. He ran the DuPont Chemical Company, a company that's still around today. He was making gunpowder for the U.S. government. So now I'm going to ask you the hardest question you will ever get asked in your whole life. Who won the War of 1812? Uh, I see Cooper typing. Survey says, oh, Cooper says the USA. That is a really good guess. The answer is, oh, hold on. There's another one in chat. One guess for Britain, two guesses for USA. And the answer is... No one. It was a draw. Um, but here's what it did, right? It kept England from taking back over, so we maintained our freedom. Now, I wish this were all a happy story, but it was 1812. It was Kentucky. It was hard work. And you know who had to do the hard work in the early 1800s? Enslaved people, right? And so we had a bunch of enslaved people working in this saltpeter mine, about 70 of them. 
And unfortunately, when America maintained its freedom, they didn't get theirs. They wouldn't see freedom until after the Civil War. And odds are, most of the men working here would not have lived to see the end of the Civil War. So they probably never got their own freedom. But it is neat to have that piece of American history still sitting in the cave. These are original from the early 1800s. These are over 200 years old, and they don't decay because they're in a dry cave. All right, so let's move on down the path, take a look at a few other things. So this is called Broadway, and you see where all the rocks have kind of broken down. This is when the cave formed. Rocks don't fall very often in the cave anymore, uh, certainly not in the toward sections. We don't take people to the parts that are unsafe. But as you walk down this big, huge cave passage, you come into a room called the church. And the church has more of the saltpeter operation in it. And so here you can see what looks like a tree braced up. This is actually the plumbing system. This is how they got water in and out of the cave. They couldn't run down the hardware store and buy PVC. So they cut down these straight trees called tulip poplar trees, drilled the center out of them, sharpened it like a pencil, stuck it inside another one like you would link straws together, and they made a plumbing system. So water could come into the cave, go over the dirt, and then they could pump it back through the pipes outside to boil it down. So this was a huge, huge process. A lot of engineering went on with this. All right, so real quick, we had a question. We know it was found in 1798, but how long do you think Mammoth Cave has been around? That is an excellent question. Uh, we estimate that Mammoth Cave started forming about 10 million years ago. All right. Now, that's an estimate. We don't know exactly for sure. And maybe it was 9,887 years ago. Uh, but we're guessing around 10 million years ago. <laughs> and someone said, holy moly. All right. Uh, that is about the best response you can have to a cave that old. Right. So now we're going to spin around in this room and take a different look at it. So this, as I said, is called the church. Okay. Now. I'm going to ask you another question, and this one should be as obvious as the War of 1812 question. What do you think they did in this room in the early 1800s? I hope you again. We call this room the church. Yeah, they had church. So what they would do is you have to remember early 1800s, Kentucky, summer, it's hot, it's miserable. And so they would take lanterns. They would light their lanterns. And they would come into the cave and um, they would lead them into this big room. And they would take some of those logs from the saltpeter works and they would sit them on the floors so people had stuff to sit on. Then they would take the lanterns and the preacher would come up here on this rock called Pulpit Rock and they would sit their lanterns up here. So if he has all the lanterns, they have no light. So the preacher's here. There's flames behind him cast on the wall. And he could keep them there as long as he wanted because there was no way out. Right now, they only did this a few times because from 1815 on, they had a much different need for the cave. Right. So remember, 1812, they had the saltpeter industry. 1815, the War of 1812 ends. By 1816, they needed a way to make money. And so they actually put a door on the cave and started selling tickets. Now, do you think people would travel to Kentucky in 1816 to take a cave tour? Yes, and 205 years later, guess what? They're still doing it. For the last 205 years, we have had cave tours coming into Mammoth Cave almost every day. Right? So pretty big, pretty big stuff. And this back here in the very back of the shot, pull up my laser pointer here. This back here in the very back is the church. So we're now coming up an upper passageway. We climbed a hill, and you can see more saltpeter vats. They did more saltpeter work back here. And as we spin around, you can see the plumbing pipe, but you also notice a set of stairs going up. And that set of stairs leads into an upper passageway called Gothic Avenue, one of our oldest toured passageways in the cave. And Gothic Avenue is a really, really special place for several reasons, and I'm going to show you some of those. Right, but first let's talk about this big space here. We call this Booth's Amphitheater. Okay, so if we think of theater, we think of acting. Okay, and if we think of the name Booth in actors, can anybody think of a famous actor 
with the last name Booth from the 1800s. He's connected to Abraham Lincoln. What do you think, Cooper? John Wilkes Booth. Ah, great. John Wilkes Booth. And what did he do? Shot Abraham Lincoln. Shot Abraham Lincoln. So do you think it would be a good idea to name a piece of the cave after a guy that killed a president? No, it would be horrible, right? But he had a very famous brother named Edwin Booth, who was a much better actor and not a bad guy. And so Edwin Booth was on tour trying to bring some, some good things to the Booth name. And he visited Mammoth Cave and somebody recognized him. It'd be like, I don't know, Dwayne Johnson was on a cave tour, right? People would know who he was. And so Edwin Booth shows up here and they're like, hey, you're a famous actor. Can you perform for us? And so he climbs up here in this passageway and he performs some Hamlet. If you've ever heard the to be or not to be, that is the question. He does that right here in this passageway. And so they name it after him. Now, what's crazy about this is his brother, John Wilkes Booth, killed Abraham Lincoln. Edwin Booth actually saved Abraham Lincoln's son because Abraham Lincoln's son fell between a train and a platform and a train station, and Edwin Booth is the one that pulled him out. So one Booth killed a Lincoln. The other Booth saved a Lincoln. We named this after the nicer Booth. All right, so let's go on up here into this passageway. So when we get up here, one of the things you're going to notice is there's lots of writing. But pay attention. This is 1837, 1832. Do you think these are real? I think they're really from the 1800s? Yeah, they are. They would take candles and they would light them and they would hold the candle really close to the ceiling and they would make a dot of smoke. And dot by dot, they would write their names on the ceiling. Now, in the 1800s, the only people that came to Mammoth Cave had money, right? You had to have money to travel um, and you had to have money to be able to go on a cave tour. And so these wealthy people would come in, they'd buy a candle, they'd smoke their name and the date on the ceiling. And what's neat about this is that sometimes it's hard to track people from the 1800s, but rich people had lots of paperwork. And so we're actually able to research these people and discover who they were, some of the things they did by the names they left inside Mammoth Cave. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of names inside Mammoth Cave written in smoke on the ceilings and walls. Now, eventually it started messing up the cave too bad. And owners were like, hey, we can't do this anymore. So the guides who were used to getting tips decided they would let people build monuments. So all you had to do was pick a rock up and set it over to the side and then stack another rock on top. And pretty soon you had a monument built and you could dedicate it to a person or to a state and this is the biggest monument in the cave. It goes all the way from floor to ceiling, and it's after a state. Does anybody know what state would have the biggest monument in Mammoth Cave? Let's see. Somebody threw something in chat. Let's take a look and see. Oh, okay. So we've got New York, okay, possibly, because it looks like the Empire State Building. Awesome. Awesome which was not around at the time that they built that monument, though. That's a good guess. Someone said Illinois. Okay, excellent. Guess what? It's the Kentucky Monument. Yeah, we're not going to let some other state have a bigger monument in Kentucky. And if they built a bigger one, when they left, we'd just knock it down, right? Easy. Now, there was a question in the chat that I didn't address but um, there was a question about, did people worry about getting stuck in the cave? And there was a question about what would happen during an earthquake. And that is great that you asked that question because, yes, you could get stuck in Mammoth Cave, right? But you'd have to try really hard. Uh, you'd have to go somewhere you weren't supposed to be. So back in the 1800s, they had been walking around in there. They knew it was big. So it wasn't a big concern getting stuck. But in 1811, the winter of 1811, 1812, we had one of the biggest earthquakes in modern U.S. history on the New Madrid Fall. The New Madrid quake of 1811 and 1812 is estimated to be over an eight, right? Probably close to a nine on the Richter scale. It created an entire lake in Tennessee called Real Foot Lake. It made the Mississippi River appear to flow backwards. They felt it in Boston, Massachusetts. 
And there were people mining saltpeter when it happened. And so we have firsthand accounts of what happened in the cave during one of the biggest earthquakes in modern history. And no rocks fell on anyone. And now today we know that's because of the way earthquakes move. Earthquake waves, they start deep, but they work their way up to the surface and kind of ripple out, just like waves on a pond, right? If you're in a really deep lake and you're on the surface, the waves will bounce you up and down. But if you're at the bottom of the lake, they don't bounce so much. So the same thing happens with earthquake waves. When an earthquake hits, it goes over the top, not through the cave. Now, if you're close to a fault, it can be dangerous. But we're not close to a major fault, so we don't have to worry about it. All right, so we've got the Kentucky Monument. Now, I told you most of Mammoth Cave is dry, but we do have some areas with formations. Formations are created by water dripping slowly from the ceiling. So this is called the Bridal Altar. All right, another hard question. If it's called the Bridal Altar, what do you think they did here in this spot? Let's see, what do we come up with? Bridal Altar. Hmm. Ah, someone said weddings. Guess what? They used to have weddings inside Mammoth Cave. Now today you can't get married inside Mammoth Cave. We're a national park, they don't let you do that. You can get married on the surface, but not in the cave. And for a long time, we thought it was just made up stories. Then we started finding invitations and letters and all kinds of stuff from people who actually had weddings inside the cave. So <clears throat> the question is, can you still get married there? You can get married at Mammoth Cave National Park. You cannot get married inside Mammoth Cave. Unless, I guess, you just bought a cave tour for your entire wedding party and then just did it. Uh, that might work. But uh, scheduling a wedding in there uh, doesn't happen. And somebody uh, just crushed someone's dreams. I'm sorry. If your goal was to get married in a cave, good news. There are thousands of caves in Kentucky you can get married in, just not Mammoth. All right. Maybe I will start my own cave wedding venue or something in the future. Be my retirement plan. <coughs> All right. So more famous people come to Mammoth Cave. Anybody recognize this lady on the right-hand side here? No, nobody recognizes her because today she's not that well-known. But I have a question for you. Has anyone seen the movie The Greatest Showman with Hugh Jackman? Yeah, he played this famous circus guy, P.T. Barnum. And P.T. Barnum goes to Europe and he meets this opera singer. Now in the movie, she sang pop music, right? But realistically, back then, she sang opera. And her name was Jenny Lind. They referred to her as the Swedish Nightingale. All right, we'll answer that question that just popped into chat in just a second. All right, so the Swedish, Swedish Nightingale, Jenny Lynn, comes to the U.S. and tours with P.T. Barnum. And while she's touring, she, like all the other rich people at the time, who's traveling through the area, stops at Mammoth Cave. She's taking a cave tour, and she comes up into Gothic Avenue. And there's this cool formation over here. It's a column. It goes from floor to ceiling, but it's hollow inside. And so it's the perfect size for a small person to back up and have a seat. And so she sat down in it. And then they named it Jenny Lynn's Armchair. So if Beyonce came to the cave today and sat on a rock, we might call it Beyonce's chair, right? But Jenny Lynn was the famous singer back then. So this is Jenny Lynn's Armchair. Now, they also call it the Devil's Armchair. So I don't know that it's a lot of bragging rights to have something named after you in the cave because uh, we do name a lot of things. And sometimes after scary things. Um, so question I had in chat, how many caves are in Kentucky? And the answer is we have no idea, all right? Thousands and thousands and thousands of caves. I can tell you that in Mammoth Cave National Park, just Mammoth Cave National Park, okay, we have Mammoth Cave, but then we have over 400 other caves that aren't even connected to Mammoth Cave. And believe it or not, Kentucky does not have the most caves. As a matter of fact, Missouri has more caves than Kentucky, and Missouri doesn't have the most caves because Tennessee has more caves than Missouri. So just in Kentucky, Tennessee, and Missouri, you're probably talking tens of thousands, who knows, maybe even more caves, and that does not even start to include what happens in other parts of the world. Uh, so Landon asks, has Mammoth Cave ever gotten flooded? Landon, 
you hold on to that, okay? We're going to visit the lower levels of Mammoth Cave in just a few minutes. But to get there, we got to go down Broadway some more. We're walking under the Cyclops Gateway. And if you look very closely, this kind of looks like an eyeball up here on the ceiling. One big eye of the Cyclops. And that leads us to the Giant's Coffin. So does this look like a big coffin with a lid on it? Yeah. So back in the 1800s, they would cast shadows on the wall, make it look like the lid was opening and closing. They'd tell scary stories. This is a huge, huge rock, right? And so this is a very famous landmark. What I like about this is we're going to zoom in on it. Do you see that name right there? J.N. McDowell, M.D., 1839. All right, so I'm going to tell you a quick story, okay? So I started working at Mammoth Cave about eight years ago. And I grew up just outside the National Park, right? So I, I'm from here. And my last name's McDowell. And my family, we're not rich people, right? Not at all. No famous people in our family that we know of. And so I'm, to, I'm leading a tour one day, and I look back at this rock, and I see this name, J.N. McDowell, MD. And I'm like, hey, a McDowell and a doctor? This could be good. What if we're related? And so I started doing some research. And so I plug in Mr. J.N. McDowell, MD, into Google, and it pops up Joseph Nash McDowell. Okay. But it leads me to his uncle, Ephraim McDowell. Has anybody ever heard of Ephraim McDowell? Yeah, he's very famous in Kentucky. He was the first surgeon out on the frontier in Kentucky. He was famous because he did a surgery that nobody thought was possible. He took this 22-pound tumor out of a lady, and he had no medicine to give her. He couldn't take away the pain. He couldn't give her antibiotics, and she lived. And so he became famous. Well, Joseph Nash was his nephew, also a brilliant doctor. Some people thought this guy was a genius. Well, he didn't get along with Ephraim very well, so he moved to Missouri, and he opened the first medical school west of the Mississippi in a little place just outside St. Louis. Okay, So he opens this medical school, and people from everywhere go to school there because they want to learn from the great Dr. McDowell. Okay? Now, the thing is, to understand the human body, it's easiest to understand if you cut it open, right? But not too many people are going to volunteer to just let you cut them open. So they needed dead bodies. And where do you find lots of dead bodies? In a cemetery. And how do you get them from the cemetery? You have to dig them up. And so he would send his students out to get bodies to do studies on, right? And that made him very unpopular with the locals. And this girl goes missing. So you know who they blamed? Dr. McDowell. Now, when the people of the town thought Dr. McDowell might have kidnapped and killed a girl, they got their pitchforks and their torches and they were going to storm his school. And on the way, he sees them coming and he gives the order to fire the cannons. See, what they didn't realize was he had put cannons in the towers of the school to protect the school. Cannons are a little excessive, right? Maybe more gun uh, power than you need. So he didn't shoot anybody, okay? And it turns out he didn't kidnap the girl. She had just run off with somebody. They found her. She was safe. But this was only the tip of the crazy. Because after he gave the order to fire the cannons and they talked him out of it, he gave the order to release the bear. He had a live bear in the basement of his school. Yeah. We don't know why. Maybe he just liked animals. But... Dr. McDowell had a daughter and she died. She was only 14, but he believed he could talk to ghosts. So he took her body and he hung it in a cave in Missouri called McDowell Cave so he could try to talk to her spirit. Now, as far as we know, he never talked to her spirit. But here's what we do know. A young boy named Samuel Clemens. Has anybody ever heard of him? Samuel Clemens used a pen name and became a writer. And his pen name was, anybody know? Mark Twain. Have we ever heard of Mark Twain? Wrote Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn. In these stories, he talks about this doctor, Dr. McDougal. Uh, he talks about Dr. Robinson, which is loosely related to Dr. McDowell. Uh, in some of his stories, he actually talks about Dr. McDowell by name. 
He talks about caves and body snatching and all these things, because when he was a young boy, he went into that cave, the cave where the body of McDowell's daughter was hung from the ceiling. And so Dr. McDowell turns out he was just crazy, but he influenced one of the greatest American authors, Mark Twain. So a lot of Mark Twain stories are linked directly to the mad doctor of Missouri, Dr. Joseph Nash McDowell, who visited Mammoth Cave in 1839. Luckily, his cave was in Missouri. He didn't get to do any crazy stuff in our cave. Excellent question. So the question was, am I related to Dr. McDowell after all? Are you ready? After tons of research, I have discovered we're not related. But still a cool story, right? And even if we were related, I probably wouldn't admit it. The guy was a little bit crazy. So we go behind the giant's coffin. We start to go deeper in the cave. We go through something called the wooden bowl room. Uh, they found a wooden bowl in here. That's why they call it that. Uh, Native American artifact. Now, this room is kind of cool because as we turn the corner, we go down something called the steps of time. Little bitty narrow spots you have to kind of duck and squeeze through. And that takes us into something called Black Snake Avenue. Black Snake Avenue leads us to uh, deeper points of the cave. We can actually go down these stairs, duck under this rock, and we start to see water, right? We've been in a dry cave all this time. Water's coming in. How does it get in? It gets in through something called a sinkhole. Anybody here seen a sinkhole before? Yeah. So a sinkhole, the easiest way to describe it is it's a hole that sinks. And when it sinks, it makes a bowl. And so when it rains, all the water runs into the bowl and down. And it comes down so fast, it cuts vertically. And so when you get into this parts of the cave, you get into what we call pits and domes. A pit is a hole that goes down. A dome is a hole that goes up. So it's all about perspective, really. It's the same thing, just depends on where you're standing when you're looking. This is called side saddle pit. It's about 35, 40 feet deep, sheer sides. The only way in is on a rope. And that's why you see stuff laying in the bottom, right? Anything that gets dropped in there stays there until we find somebody brave enough to rappel down and get it. And so... This was taken a few years ago, and it's still there because we still haven't found anybody brave enough to rappel in and get it yet. But just ahead is something called the bottomless pit. And the bottomless pit's 105 feet deep and cuts the trail in two. In 1838, a young man named Stephen Bishop became one of the primary guides of Mammoth Cave. Stephen was enslaved, right? So he wasn't here by choice. But... The guy that owned Stephen owned the cave, and he made Stephen one of his cave guides. Now, Stephen was a great guide, but he was an even better explorer. When Stephen started working at Mammoth Cave, they knew about 10 miles of cave. When Stephen finished working at Mammoth Cave, he had discovered about 20 extra miles of cave just on his own. Now, we're talking about a guy that was doing this not with fancy lights and fancy gear, right? He was wearing just his normal clothes and carrying a lantern. A lantern that's burning, which means he had to have plenty of fuel and a whole lot of nerve. In 1838, he crossed the bottomless pit. Now, there's some debate how he did it, but best we can tell was a visitor came on a tour and said, hey, I want to go where no one's ever been before. And Stephen's like, hey, I know where someone's never been before, on the other side of the big hole. So they brought down a log and they laid it over the hole. Stephen put the lantern in his teeth scooted across the log to the other side. Now, if you couldn't see the bottom of a giant pit, would you put a flaming lantern in your teeth and crawl across the log to the other side? No, no, I am not that brave either. I've done some caving, but I'm not Stephen Bishop level caver, right? But when he got across, he found something awesome. He found a place we call Fat Man's Misery. Now he called it the winding way because when he came through, all of this was full of sand. So he was belly crawling way up here at the top. He actually had to crush his lantern down a little bit. They had these wire pieces on it, so they were collapsible. And he had to crush it down so he could scoot it through there and scoot through on his belly. Well, once he discovered that it went somewhere cool, they dug all the dirt out. And what they found was a keyhole passage. And what that means is it's wide at the top, skinny at the bottom. And so as you walk through this passage, the sides get higher and higher and tighter and tighter until it's about 18 inches wide. Right? So... Big people have a little more trouble than small people getting through this passage, right? It is natural. 
But when you get through it, you run into something called tall man's agony. So instead of this getting wide, this levels off to rock, and now you're squatted down, duck walking, to get through the passage. And you come out the other side into something called Great Relief Hall. And it's a great relief because you can finally stand up again, right? And you can see people hung out here, wrote their names on the ceiling, uh, spent lots of time, probably had a pretty good workout to get into this room. Um, so this was a place to kind of hang out. Now, just below this room, something crazy happens. All of this time, we've been seeing kind of this flat rock, um, a little bit of arching, but not a lot of texture. Well, as soon as you go into the next room, if you look at the ceiling, you're going to notice it's very rippled. It almost looks like waves. And that's because this is where water has rubbed over and over and over against the rock. It's called scalloping. Okay. We call this river hall because guess what visits us in this room occasionally? The underground river. So Landon, you asked the question, does it flood in Mammoth Cave? And the answer is, Absolutely. It floods all the time in Mammoth Cave, but we don't have to stop cave tours because our cave is about 400 feet deep. And so we can give tours way up there around the rotunda and stuff. Even if this room floods, we can still do plenty of tours. Now, I have seen water in this room a couple of times. The last time that it really flooded big was 2010. Nashville, Tennessee flooded. We flooded. Okay. But back this dark passage, it continues to go deeper. So Stephen made it here about 1839. Do you think he went off deeper into the dark passage, or do you think he started making his way back out? Cooper says up. Well, you wouldn't be wrong, Cooper. He did eventually go up, but he's Stephen Bishop, one of the greatest explorers. So first he went down, and he found the underground rivers. This one's called the River Styx. Now, these underground rivers are amazing features because this is water that came in by the interstate, traveled underground all the way through Mammoth Cave, and eventually comes out in the Green River outside. This is the water that makes the cave. This is water that's still making the cave. And it's full of things like eyeless cavefish, eyeless crayfish, eyeless shrimp. There's a freshwater shrimp in Kentucky. Um, and Stephen was one of the first people to ever see these creatures in person. As a matter of fact, when he told people about them, they thought he was crazy. But eventually, they started catching them and selling them as souvenirs. So if you came to Mammoth Cave, you could buy an eyeless fish and take it home. And you know how long it would last? Not very long. It'd be dead before you got it home. But it was so cool to see that a man named Ralph Waldo Emerson, another famous author, shows up at Mammoth Cave to take a cave tour because he has seen an eyeless fish in a bottle that came from Mammoth Cave. So in the 1850s, he shows up and takes a cave tour so he can get his own souvenir fish. And he even wrote an essay about Mammoth Cave called Illusions, where he talks about Stephen and he talks about a room called Star Chamber and his experience. And so, again, big cave, lots of influence in American history. Now, Stephen did eventually have to go back up and he found a place called Mammoth Dome. So this is Mammoth Dome. It's about 175 feet tall. And Stephen walks into the bottom of this room, looks up, and I can only imagine how he felt seeing a space this big in the cave. And on the floor was a lantern. And he remembered a story about how during the Saltpeter days, this young enslaved boy was lowered down this giant pit where they were trying to find more dirt. And on the way down, the young boy dropped his lantern and he watched it fall and fall and fall and smack the floor. He screamed, they pulled him back up, and no one ever went down again. That was right down from the rotunda. They called it Crevice Pit. So now Stephen walks in, he finds this lantern, he looks up and he realizes he's just made a connection from the deepest parts of Mammoth Cave to the highest parts of Mammoth Cave all in one room. And then he turned around and went back because there was no way to get up it. And people would continue going back until the 1950s. And in the 1950s, they built a flight of stairs. And then in 2008, they were nice enough to update the stairs because in the 1950s, the stairs were really narrow and kind of straight up, like climbing a fire tower. So they built these big wide stairs several years ago. And now we can go all the way back up to the upper levels of cave without having to backtrack the two miles that Stephen had to. Now, 
This is just what you see on the historic tour. Everything that I've shown you fits within a two mile stretch of the 412 miles of Mammoth Cave. So when you come take a cave tour, you can see all of this stuff, but you might also see big places like cathedral domes, migrating shafts. You might see places like the frozen Niagara where there's dripstone formations with stalactites and stalagmites and flowstone and columns. You might see gypsum flowers. This is a soft mineral that grows on the wall in a dry cave. You might see gypsum blisters in a place called the snowball dining room where it looks like people took snowballs and stuck them to the ceiling. All of this is found in this one cave system because it's such a big complex system of cave. Now recently we've put a lot of focus into our fossils. What most people don't realize is that limestone, which is what makes up Mammoth Cave, is formed under the ocean. This limestone has fossils in it. All these fossils are seashells. So this is actually the end of a coral called a horn coral. And it gets its name because it's shaped like a horn. Right? But that's not all we've found. We have also found brachiopods, which are like clamshells. That's the state fossil of Kentucky. Crinoids, which kind of look like a, a flower, but they're actually an animal. And then this big thing here is a shark tooth. So 350 million years ago, when this cave, when the rock was formed, there were sharks swimming around Kentucky. Now, shark teeth are not hard to find as fossils, but what is almost never found are shark bones because shark skeletons are made of cartilage, not calcium bones like ours. They don't have the hard bones. But in Mammoth Cave this last year, we discovered the jaw of a shark. This was such an amazing find that it has made national news. There are paleontologists whose careers are now set because of these discoveries. And they're going in and they're looking and they're looking and they're looking to find more of this stuff. They're finding amazing things. Over 60 different species have been identified now that used to live in Kentucky hundreds of millions of years ago. We're talking about before dinosaurs ever existed. Okay. And because of all this information, an artist was able to put a picture together of what Kentucky probably looked like. So if you traveled back in time, 350 million years, this is what Mammoth Cave would have looked like. Right? An ocean. This big shark is a Savotus striatus. It's about the size of a great white shark. And this is what they think happened when that jawbone was left behind. Shark died. Smaller species start feeding on it. We know this because there's little bitty teeth from multiple species all around that. But they also have all these other sharks that they've identified through uh, things like fin spines, um, teeth, all sorts of things. Now, along with that, these are the crinoids, the sea lilies, which again are animals. We know we had species of stingray, orthoceras, which were kind of like these little squid creatures and these cone shells. Uh, you would have had the brachiopods. You would have had corals. You would have had an ocean teeming with life. All of it living and dying right here in Kentucky and eventually becoming the limestone that makes up Mammoth Cave. Now, if you're adventurous, our tours go from your basic walking tours down to crawling tours, all the way to cave exploration with the Cave Research Foundation. This passage is called Kathleen's Crawl. Here you can see someone crawling through it. The ceiling is touching the back. The floor is touching the belly. Does this look like the kind of place you'd want to go? Oh, yeah. This is awesome. This is a great crawl. And if you think this would be fun, eventually on this tour route, because this is part of a cave tour called the Wild Cave Tour, eventually we can take you here. This is called No Name Pass. You'll notice... Hills are touching the ceiling, toes are touching the floor, and this person's foot isn't very big. This whole passageway is nine inches tall. When you get in there, you have to turn your head to one side, lay flat on your belly, and scoop. I have to turn my feet sideways because they will fit through this way. All right. So Mammoth Cave is big, but Mammoth Cave is also very small, depending on where you go. Some parts of Mammoth Cave are great for everybody. Some parts not everybody's up for. All right. So lots of stuff I threw at you. What kind of questions do you have? Let's see. 
Let's go back just a second. Let's look at some of these. Cooper said, uh, are there diamonds? Absolutely. Are there diamonds in Mammoth Cave? No. Uh, not unless somebody drops their wedding ring or uh, an earring or something. All right. Uh, no diamonds found in limestone. Uh, and if there were, they would have mined the place a long time ago. It would have never been a cave tour. It would have been a big mine. Uh, were there dinosaur fossils? Excellent question. So the rock is older than dinosaurs. The cave is younger than dinosaurs. So dinosaurs existed in Kentucky, but because there was no rock developing in this area, we have no dinosaur fossils, right? In order for something to fossilize, rock has to be formed around it. And so there's probably tons of species that existed that we'll never know about because they just never became fossils. Uh, we have found mastodon tusk and cave bear bones, and even vampire bat skeletons. So we used to have vampire bats in Kentucky. Um, Cooper's mom says, no way. Was that on the caving, on the crawling through small spaces? Yeah, it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. We even have a kid's version, though. I just took some kids the other day, and we did some crawling through some little places. We have a tour called Trog for 8 to 12-year-olds, and we crawl through some little bitty places. Yeah. So if you get a chance... When those types of things open back up for us, and that's something you're interested in, come visit. We happily take you caving. All right. Any other questions before I let you guys go? Yeah. What do you got, Cooper? How do, How long does the water um, thing go? The like, water thing? The river? Does, yeah. How long does the river go for? Well, I mean, technically, as far as the length of the river, um, probably... 10 plus miles, the water comes in, well, probably farther than that, probably 20 miles. It comes in around the town of Cave City, headed toward the town of Glasgow, right, which is, Glasgow is probably about 20 miles from the park, and then it dumps out in the Green River, which runs through the park. So all that water is traveling underground, which is why we have such a big cave system, right, because it's carving from so far away. A lot of Mammoth Cave actually sits outside of the National Park. And there's about nine different underground rivers that we know about in Mammoth Cave. So, yeah, Landon's mom said no way to the nine-inch crawl also. You know, a lot of people say no way to that nine-inch crawl, but I promise you it is tons of fun once you get there. Probably not going to talk you into it, though. Usually people are either okay with it or they're not doing it, one of the two. Now, that doesn't mean you couldn't go crawling in the cave. We don't have to go through the tiny places. We can go through bigger places too. So don't let that scare you away thinking that everybody's got to crawl through that little space. We can take you a different way where you don't have to squeeze quite so much. It is still small, but it's not nine inches. All right, any other questions? All right, well, I want to say then on behalf of all of Mammoth Cave National Park, thank you guys so much for letting me join you. I hope you enjoyed this little look at uh, Mammoth Cave. Excellent questions. Thank you guys for participating so well. And uh, hopefully at some point, I actually see you in person at Mammoth Cave. Thank you so much. It was a great tour. Glad you enjoyed it. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.